Dr. Manning Marable is one of America's most influential and widely read scholars of the black experience. And indeed, I can personally think of no one in the academy today better suited to delivering the W.E.B. Du Bois lectures at Harvard University than Manning Marable. Since 1993, Dr. Marable has been professor of public affairs, political science, and history at Columbia University in New York City. For 10 years, uh, he has served as founding director of the Institute for Research in African American Studies at Columbia from 1993 to 2003. And as you all know, he's had a phenomenal string of success in recruiting a number of name uh, individuals to join that unit. Dr. Marable is also the director of the newly established Center for Contemporary Black History at Columbia. The center's projects include the Malcolm X Project, that is constructing a web-based multimedia version of the autobiography of Malcolm X, the Africana Criminal Justice Project, that focuses on strategies to empower ex-prisoners in communities devastated by mass incarceration, and the publication of the quarterly academic journal, Souls. There are few people uh, in the academy who can, in fact, give our good friend Skip Gates a run for his money in terms of uh, productivity and profile. Manning is one of the people on that very short list. Uh, Dr. Marabou has written over 250 journal articles and has authored and edited nearly 20 books in scholarly anthologies. If you're like me, in fact, you keep a Manning Marabou section uh, in, in your library uh, and you expect it to grow each year if not by one, maybe two or three volumes. I think if you're like me, you all still consult and keep on your bookshelves a well-worn copy of How Capitalism <laughs> Underdeveloped Black America, published in 1983. Likewise, near the top of Manning's greatest hits, one would have to include Black American Politics, published in 1985, W.E.B. Du Bois, Black Radical Democrat, in 1986, Race, Reform, and Rebellion, The Second Reconstruction in Black America, 1945 to 1990, published in 91. Recently, Dr. Marable, in collaboration uh, with Leith Mullins, has edited Freedom, published by Faden Press, and Let Nobody Turn Us Around, Voices of Resistance, Reform, and Renewal, an African-American anthology, which is published by Roman Littlefield. His most recent book, uh, which is entitled The Great Wells of Democracy, The Meaning of Race in American Life, was published in 2003 by Basic Books. His books in progress include, and this is, this is a partial list, um, a full-length, two-volume multimedia biography of African-American leader Malcolm X, an edited volume documenting the historical writings by black scholars and prisoners on racism and criminal justice, a critical interpretations of the various meanings of justice to black Americans entitled Imagining Justice, and a book-length project examining the various ways racial groups and people of divergent backgrounds construct and interpret their memory and experiences, which has as its working title, uh, Living Black History, Memory, Identity, and the Struggle for Black Consciousness. Manning is, to my mind, the epitome of the grounded, organic intellectual not merely a presence uh, in the halls of the academy, nor just a public intellectual, but a man always connected to and involved with concrete social organizing and speaking out for change. In this regard, in 1976, Manning has written Along the Color Line, a political commentary series that appears in over 400 newspapers and journals worldwide. He's also regularly featured in national and international media and donates his time to fundraising and speaking on behalf of prisoners' rights, labor, civil rights, faith-based institutions, and other social justice organizations. Dr. Marable lectures frequently in Sing Sing Prison, among other places, Austining in, in New York, and has a master's degree program for prisoners there. Uh, Dr. Marable has chosen as the general topic for his Du Bois lectures this year, Living Black History, his opening lecture is entitled Resurrecting the African American Intellectual Tradition. Please, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Manning Marable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's so wonderful to see many friends and colleagues at this institution who've come out this afternoon. I'd like to welcome you all. The lectures that I've prepared over the next three afternoons form the corpus of a book that I'm preparing for Harvard University Press, which, cross my fingers, hopefully will be out in the fall of 2005, entitled Living Black History. 
The lecture today, uh, one of the things that's always difficult for a writer is to time the delivery of a lecture presented orally because when you change and you work with a, a, with a series of text, you're never quite sure how long it's going to take to deliver them. So I'm going to try to stick, be disciplined, and stick to the text so you'll get a sense of what the book is really about, is truly about. We all live history every day. But history is more than the construction of collective experiences or the knowledge drawn from cataloged and stored artifacts from the past. History is also the architecture of a people's memory, framed by our shared rituals, traditions, and notions of common sense. It can be nothing more than a ragged bundle of hopes, especially for those who have been forcibly relegated beyond society's formal boundaries. I believe that historically oppressed people in the United States generally think about their living history very differently from those closer to centers of institutional power. Because of the difficult circumstances of their lives, the oppressed appear sometimes to celebrate myth over factual accuracy, tales of romantic resistance over somber subordination. To my knowledge, very few black poets have ever written lyrics in praise of the heroic exploits of Booker T. Washington, Clarence Thomas, or Condi Rice. By contrast, there are literally thousands of powerful representations and examples of poetry, plays, jazz, symphonies, even operas inspired by the heroic figure of Malcolm X. Blacks tend even to make critical distinctions about authenticity among their most celebrated and popular public figures. Several years ago, for example, I inquired about the critical differences between Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X to my students in the Malcolm X seminar I teach annually at Columbia University. One of my African-American students quickly responded, explaining that the distinction was, well, quite easy to be made. Dr. King, he explained, belongs to the entire world, but Malcolm X belongs to us. At Malcolm X's Harlem funeral in February 1965, celebrated actor-activist Ossie Davis his eulogy and memorable description of Malcolm as, quote, the black shining prince, unquote, captured both the tragedy and the triumph of that moment. Interviewing my friend Ossie for Columbia's Malcolm X Research Biography Project in the summer of 2003, I inquired why he used that particular word, prince, Ossie explained that Malcolm had inspired awe and admiration among blacks worldwide and deep love among the residents of Harlem in particular because he consistently appeared to speak truth to power, symbolically representing the spirit of black people. Quote, he was, Davis recalled, the person that we wished we all could be, unquote that blended through the fabric of Harlem's myth and legend was also a sense of tremendous pain and sadness. Quote, a prince, Ossie said, can never be a king. Malcolm's greatness is found in his personal determination to become much more than he was. Black folk recognized that life's complex journey, his life's complex journey had been brutally cut short his full potential forever unfulfilled. It was an unfinished life. C.L.R. James, the great intellectual, expressed a similar observation about Brother Malcolm in a 67 London lecture. James described Malcolm as, quote, that great freedom fighter whose potentialities were growing so fast that his opponents had to get rid of him, unquote. 
James certainly did not share Malcolm's black nationalist political philosophy, but it is not difficult to imagine Nello, as he was generally and widely known among his friends, interrogating the black militant Muslim in an intense but casually intimate rambling conversation. Nello had an enormous curiosity about peoples and cultures of all types. Above all, James particularly would want to identify and to comprehend the precise historical and social forces that had helped to construct and produce the space from which a talented personality such as Malcolm had emerged. Now, my theoretical approach to the writing of African American history and the construction of black studies and more generally cultural studies and interdisciplinary research projects across the board has been directly, it's what I call directly connected with what I call living history, directly reflects and it is represented by a statement by James, a remarkable 1970 essay, short piece, entitled, quote, Black People in Urban Areas of the United States. James observed in 1970, quote, the black people who dominate the inner cities numerically cannot possibly work out a plan or have any program by which they can improve their own situation, which does not take into account the city as a whole. A new situation has arisen for the urban black, for thinking in terms of the whole city, means that you are automatically thinking in terms of the state, and from the state you find yourself thinking and facing the whole nation, unquote. Social historians have said for decades that the social protest movements of the African American community throughout its history have, but especially since the great migration and the urbanization of the black population in the early 20th century, have been an important template for fashioning other American reform movements. This is undeniably true, but not only within the United States, but for social movements throughout much of the modern world. The Black Freedom Movement created a successful model of popular resistance that helped to shape and inspire the modern women's rights movement, the gay and lesbian rights movement, the Chicano liberation struggle, and many others. The Black Panthers directly influenced the development of the Puerto Rican Young Lords Party, the American Indian Movement, and even reform and radical struggles among a white American senior citizens in the early 70s, calling themselves the Gray Panthers. Few Americans, regardless of race, can recall the most memorable words or even coherent ideas expressed in a George W. Bush speech. <laughs> it's true. Man's incoherent. It's scary. <laughs> but few of us will ever forget the I Have a Dream speech uttered by Martin on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial that hot August afternoon in 1963. Stamped deeply in public memory it is now central to our collective understanding of what an American democracy should be. Why does Martin's language still resonate for us today? It is because, not simply because he was a moving and powerful orator, but because what he was talking about actually had real social depth and social meaning to literally every American. Even the white segregationists who hated him and who rejected his politics understood the significance of what was being said. This explains to a considerable extent why most white Americans have difficulty interrogating the meaning of their own whiteness or how white racial identity was historically constructed for the brutal social processes that directly involve the transatlantic slave trade chattel slavery, and massive American Indian removal from to reservations. White Americans are constantly reinforced to handle the common history they share with African Americans very differently than we do. The majority of them, in short, 
have not a clue that virtually every major advance in expanding and reforming this nation's democratic institutions was either directly caused by or at least profoundly influenced by the black American struggle for freedom. For most white Americans, American history remains a narrative about an inevitable series of conquests over indigenous peoples, over frontiers, over boundaries and borders, over vast stretches of geography, and even over space itself. Embedded in that celebrated contest, conquest are a series of ideas about the significance of individual liberty, the ownership of private property, and certain restrictions on the authority and power of the central government over personal activity and initiative. The history that is generally codified in the form of classroom textbooks and sets the boundaries of civic discourse emphasizes the character of the American experience as both exceptional and unique, but also universal in the sense that our history's underlying core democratic values can literally be transported and adopted and grafted onto other peoples in distant lands, thereby enhancing the quality of their lives. In effect, this isn't in the text, but to play fast and loose with Amilcar Cabral's observation that under a colonial situation, the colonized people leave their own history and join the history of someone else. The U.S. wishes to impose its peculiar history, which is yet unique and universal, on other people. They cease to live in their own history, and they join our history of conquest. Right? To become American is more than anything else, to accept the legitimacy of this master narrative. The great difficulty for white Americans is that there is a mountain of historical evidence. Native American artifacts, the burial ground of enslaved Africans next to Wall Street, 20,000 bodies, remnants of internment camps formerly holding Japanese Americans during World War II, that undermine the legitimacy of that grand narrative. Consensus and intergroup cooperation rather than class conflict and struggle are deliberately emphasized <clears throat> with the objective of assimilation of the divergent interests and factions into a pluralistic har har harmonious whole, e pluribus unum. But in a society organized around structural racism, with the ongoing racial stigmatization and systematic exploitation of a significant segment of the population, that task is at best difficult because it demands the selective suppression of historical evidence itself. This occurs in so many ways, big ways, little ways, such as for many years, the National Park Service's description on the sites of slave shanties behind the homes, the gracious mansions of Mount Vernon of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson's Monticello as servants' quarters. Or as in the case of the all-black neighborhood of Rosewood, Florida, in the aftermath of the murderous mass racist assault by whites against black people in early January 1923, it takes place through the physical elimination of any evidence that an African-American community once existed there. In that regard, the parallels between the United States and South Africa under the former apartheid regime are quite striking. In 1955, for example, the apartheid government began bulldozing a multiracial neighborhood outside of Johannesburg called Sophia Town, as the home of extraordinary writers, artists, and performers such as Miriam Makiba and Hugh Masekela. Sophia Town was described by one novelist as perhaps the most perfect experiment in non-racial community living. In the ruins of what had been Sophia Town, an Africana working class suburb was built, given the name Triumph, Afrikaans, for triumph. 
The South African whites understood that simply the continued existence of Sophia Town undermined the rationale for Herrenvolk, master race, the principle of white supremacy, and its values that gave legitimacy to the racist state. This process of reshaping public memory directly contributed to the deliberate distancing of whites from the common hidden history they actually shared with black people. Today, most white Americans do have a somewhat fuzzy awareness that an American Civil War did take place. But they possess no deep personal understanding or deep comprehension of what slavery was about. They do not understand the contours of abolitionism. They don't really have a deep understanding of why the conflict actually took place. But you see, because my great-grandfather, Morris Marable, was sold on an auction block in West Point, Georgia, in 1854 at the age of nine, for the sum of $500 by the man who was both his owner and his biological father, I have acquired, consequently, a very different relationship to those distant events 150, exactly 150 years ago. When we feel personally connected with events from the past, they can help shape our actions today, thus to a degree bending the construction and trajectory of our own future history. Through my great-grandfather, I feel an intimate connection with the struggle against slavery. Most white Americans feel no such commitment because they believe that they have no responsibility for and derive no material benefit from the enslavement of African Americans. It is absurd, they reason, to apologize for something in which they have no personal involvement or personal responsibility. It would have been impossible for African Americans not to have been influenced by America's master narrative. Thereby, to some significant extent, we too have been pushed to deny the validity of our own material culture and collective experiences the subterranean desire for inclusion, and the benefits to be derived from selectively forgetting America's mistakes are indeed powerful incentives toward cultural and ideological assimilation. After all, we have coexisted side by side in the same geographical space for hundreds of years. We have shared, in most respects, a collective language of memory Yet much of the historical evidence drawn directly from black folk themselves indicates that all during this time, since our enslavement, white Americans may have spoken a common language, but generally interpreted day-to-day -day events in strikingly divergent ways. As the editors of Remembering Slavery, African Americans talk about their personal experiences of slavery and freedom, make clear in their oral histories, white Southerners uniformly emphasize the close relationships between slaves and owners, downplay the violence and exploitation upon which slavery rested. The editors write, quote, they glorify the docile darkies who had served so faithfully, the loyal mammies who had nursed both white and black children, and the trusted servants who protected the plantation against the hated Yankees. Formerly enslaved African Americans and their children, conversely, quote, describe the endless indignities of chattel bondage, its numerous perils to family life, the trauma that accompanied beatings, mutilations, and murders, the prohibitions against education and religious worship, the denial of basic civil rights they would claim as their own during Reconstruction, unquote. Oral histories of slavery and its aftermath based on the reconstructed memories of enslaved African Americans are undoubtedly more accurate than the writings and reflections of their former owners. But even they must be viewed quite critically. A paper by the Popular Memory Group, a collective of historians based at the University of Birmingham's Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies, which was published back about 20, 25 years ago, makes this observation. Private memories of individuals cannot, quote, 
be readily unscrambled from the effects of dominant historical discourses. It is often these that supply the very terms by which a private history is thought through. Memories of the past are, like all common sense forms, strangely composite constructions resembling a kind of geology, the selective sedimentation of past traces, unquote. A broad review of the thousands of ex-slave oral histories compiled by the Federal Writers Project during the middle and late 30s reveals, in the words of my colleague at Columbia, Robin Kelly, quote, the complicated character of their collections. Many former slaves, giving their oral history, spoke, Robin says, quote, in vague generalities that owed at least as much to their suspicions about the questioners as to the dimness of their recollections, unquote. What Robin is saying is they tried to cloak their experiences in a way in Aesopian language, describing their own experiences as a slave as benign, but simultaneously recounting the horrific brutalities and violence of daily life to the slaves on the next plantation. The former slaves generally preferred to focus on the recent past, the immediate past, and not to go deep back in time to talk about their great-grandparents or grandparents and what they suffered. Because if you do that, you then begin to honor things like the destruction, the breaking apart of, of, of families and husbands from wives and children from parents. It is easier talking about personal recollections than going deep and recalling the anguish of the deep past. The dramas, they would rather talk about the drama of emancipation, of jubilee, rather than providing any detailed recounting of their parents' stories that they learned as a child. Efforts to document the lives, and just as an aside, this is trauma. This is trauma. Memories that skip, that shuffle order. You see trauma in these texts. And in writing the biography of Malcolm, I have really had to get into this. That's what you're seeing here. Now, efforts to document the lives of oppressed people are also complicated by the fact that there are usually a minimum number of what historians call primary source materials, legitimate hard evidence. What, my, what I learned at the University of Wisconsin or uh, with Lewis Harlan at the University of Maryland, who's my advisor. Um, in the book, The History of Everyday Life, Alf Lundke observed that for the vast majority of working class people, quote, the joys and sufferings, the longings and worries of earlier generations have often left little more than a smudged imprint on the material sources that remain or are encoded there in a cryptic form, unquote. Hence, the historical investigator is forced, we are forced, to elicit information, to draw it out from reports, as Lunke says, reports by policy and factory inspectors, teachers' reports, or statements from church ministers, tax records. One must do more than just simply to decode such texts to highlight the voices and experiences of oppressed people. It is also necessary to recognize that the data collection process itself is frequently tainted, and it was indeed frequently part of the structure of domination, even with categories of inquiry designed to reinforce dominant subordinate relationships. Some African-American intellectuals at the beginning of the 20th century recognized that the generations of blacks who had personally experienced enslavement were rapidly disappearing and that some measures to preserve and document their personal stories had to be initiated. 
In the 1920s, black scholars had racially segregated institutions, such as Fisk University, Kentucky State University, and Southern University in Louisiana, began to interview and document the stories of former slaves. Subsequently, during the Great Depression, through the initiative of Lawrence Reddick at Kentucky State, John and Ruby Lomax, Zora Neale Hurston, and many other scholars, thousands of ex-slave narratives were recorded and collected as a part of the Federal Writers Project. Despite fierce criticisms of most white historians, nearly all at the time, who in one voice, in unison, said that formerly enslaved blacks' testimonials constitute corrupted and tainted evidence, corrupted, biased information. It lacks the scholarly objectivity of white public documents and white observers of enslavement. Now, these oral histories understood that the historical knowledge produced by the slaves themselves had to be preserved in order to be conveyed to successive generations. And this is the fundamental observation about a methodology of living history. History is not genetic, folks. If you don't preserve it, you lose it. And in the Q&A, I can just tell you horrific stories. I'm on a personal crusade. If you read my piece I wrote about two years ago for the Crisis magazine back in 02 in the fall, in going to people's homes, prominent intellectuals, writers, and seeing intellectual property in storage bins rotting, and your intellectual legacy, our tradition, is being destroyed. Look what has happened to Malcolm. And, well, I'll describe that tomorrow. Okay. Now, it is perhaps not a coincidence that during this current conservative period that we are all enduring the dismantling of affirmative action, the elimination of minority economic set-asides, they don't even exist anymore. Minority scholarship programs and other reforms, the construction of a pri racialized prison industrial complex, the death of the second reconstruction, the suppression of civil liberties on the altar of a Patriot Act, that African American intellectuals have once again sought to hold on to and preserve and document many of the lessons and personal examples from a more heroic period period in which we believed that history was on our side. The best publicized recent effort is the History Makers Project, launched in 1999 by attorney and television producer Juliana Richardson. The goal of History Makers is to produce an archive of 5,000 first-person narratives of African Americans, to quote her website, quote, both well-known and unsung, her objective and the project's literature states, quote, is to show that the world, to, is to show the world that African American history is American history. And that African American history makers number not only in the hundreds, but the thousands, unquote. Toward that end, History Makers has hosted a variety of multimedia productions and events, including an evening with Harry Belafonte, televised on PBS. An evening with Ossie Davis and Ruby Dee at Chicago's Art Institute. They created the pioneers in the struggle. A TV documentary and ed educational CD-ROM tracing the history of blacks who have served since 1877 in the Illinois State Assembly. Financing this extraordinary effort, Richardson had raised $2.5 million by the end of 2002 through grants, private donations, and from foundations. A parallel multimedia effort, somewhat smaller, has been led by René Poussin, a former ABC News correspondent, and philanthropist Camille Cosby, called the National Visionary Leadership Project. This project identifies African Americans over the age of 70 who have made significant contributions to the social, political, cultural, and political life of both black America and the country. Richardson has described her 
effort, her project, and these other efforts as, quote, preserving living history. While these and other documentary initiatives are indeed admirable and worthy of full and generous support, in fact, I am a board member of Poussin and Cosby's National Visionary Leadership Project. They merit, I believe, a certain reservation. Both largely separate history from theory and politics. Richardson seeks to place the historical narrative of black people in America into America's mainstream narrative about itself. What must be done instead is the subversion of the master narrative, which must involve to a great extent, to a great degree, the deconstruction of the legitimacy of white racial identity, the uncovering and examination of the massive crimes against humanity that have been routinely sanctioned and carried out by corporate power and by the state. The corpses must be exhumed, not for purposes of ritualistic ancestor worship, as some of my Afrocentric friends might do, but to study the forensic evidence to determine who was actually responsible for such crimes that were committed. C.L.R. James and the Black Jacobins reminds us astutely that revenge has no place in politics, yet any culture without a deep reservoir drawing upon collective memory, enhanced by civic conversations and indeed civic rituals, inevitably ceases to exist. Our purpose should not be to indict the dead, but to make their descendants see themselves and their own history in radically new ways. The most important quality that makes black folk as a people different from other Americans is not really their race. It's not even their culture. It is indeed our history. <laughs> to blacks, our existence has fundamentally meant struggle you could never afford to stand still. As my friend Amiri says, a culture that stands still dies. You must keep moving. C.L.R. James, Nello observed and understood this. And he says in his 1970 essay, quote, the black people in the United States are the most socially united group in the country. They all have one unifying, one unifying characteristic. What is that? They suffer from that historical development which has placed them in the role of second class citizens. There is no other national group which automatically constitutes one social force with a unified outlook and the capacity to make unified moves in politics and to respond to economic problems. It is from America's urban blacks that many people all over the world have historically gained a consciousness of the problems that black people suffer and their attempts to overcome them, unquote. Black consciousness arose from the recognition that race was the fundamental contradiction within the U.S. state and its politics. And that is because, as Martin and Malcolm completely understood, the U.S. state was constructed on a distinctively racial foundation. The nation's first law, the Immigration Act of 1790, limited citizenship solely to free white persons, quote, unquote. Doesn't this help to explain why most Asians born in Asia, continental Asia, could not become citizens of this country until 1952? That is why the majority of African-American voters could not cast ballots in the U.S. presidential election until, in effect, 1968. Race truly matters, as Brother Quinnell says, in the United States. Let us therefore approach the construction of a new black history from the vantage point of the evolution of black consciousness over time. The state of being conscious critically self-aware, prefigures both a sense of capacity and potential agency. 
In racially stratified societies for the oppressed, it involves a fundamental recognition that structures or practices that exist within daily life retard or destroy one's development or full human potentiality. At a certain stage, as racialized populations reflect upon the accumulated concrete experiences of their own lives or the lives of others who share their own situation, and even those who have died long ago, a process of discovery unfolds that begins to restructure how they understand the world and their place within it. The journey of discovery can produce a desire to join with others to construct initiatives that create liberated space, permitting the renewal or survival of a group or a celebration of its continued existence despite the forces arrayed against it. Knowledgeable civic actors draw important lessons from that history, which does incrementally increase their civic capacity. Historical amnesia blocks the construction of potentially successful social protest movements as the distance between the past, the present, and the future is made shorter and closer as it collapses. Individuals more easily acquire a sense of becoming the makers, the actors of their own history. Consciousness exists in the delicate space between history and imagination, part memory, part possibility. The development of a historical political praxis that could systematically interrogate the evolution of black consciousness would involve the linking of the past as a record of actual events with alternative visions of what might have existed had structural racism not existed, or at least had significantly declined in social significance. Historian Paul Miller describes the latter process is his term, counterfactual history. A critical inquiry grounded in facts but creating possible alternative paths or different historical trajectories. The basic question Miller pursued in a very fine piece in the Chronicle about a month ago of higher education was whether, what if the Allies had bombed and destroyed Auschwitz and other Nazi concentration camps during World War II? In doing so, the, wouldn't the Allies have saved thousands, perhaps millions of Jewish lives? Counterfactual inquiry, combined with historical methodology, Miller argues, has led scholars to, quote, hitherto silent sources. When you ask a question about something that never took place, you must analyze all possible reasons for it not taking place, including those given by the very people who had the power to make history turn out differently, unquote. In African-American history, there have been numerous decisive moments when the trajectories of black history could have progressed in quite different ways, leading to qualitatively different social outcomes. One important illustration that comes immediately to mind is the issue of land reform and own property ownership for ex-slaves following the American Civil War in 1865. 40 acres allocated to each African-American family in 1865 would have called for the seizure of about 40 million acres of farmland by the federal government. Part of this could have been accomplished had Congress in 1866 passed Thaddeus Stevens's proposal to confiscate the property of all former slaveholders owning 200 or more slaves. The lack of land redistribution and financial assets by black people has been perhaps the most single most important element in the racialized equity and equity that continues to plague blacks in this country to this day. Imagining plausible alternative scenarios based on factual evidence can help us to understand the consequences of history while exposing the connections between history and the construction of power. The failure to enact comprehensive land reform during Reconstruction paved the way for the emergence of sharecropping and debt peonage, which burdened millions of black people into poverty generation after generation. The parallel dynamic of economic underdevelopment occurred in the mid to late 20th century with the massive disinvestment of 
billions of dollars from U.S. central cities, setting into motion new processes of racialization, culminating in today's racialized prison industrial complex and to, into what Mike Davis accurately describes as dead cities, which are, of course, predominantly black and brown. Banks and savings and loans, Mike Davis says, quote, pumped capital out of inner cities, but refused to loan it back, especially in black majority neighborhoods. Instead, they drained, quote, northeastern savings into the Sun Belt, stoking massive speculative building booms. Local banks in Brooklyn, for example, in the 1970s, con committed less than 6% of mortgage money to the Home Bureau, but fully 63% of local savings generated in Brooklyn was used to export to finance Florida real estate. This massive economic underdevelopment that we have, wit we have bear witness to, we have seen it, set into motion destructive social forces that had practical long-lasting racialized consequences for us. One productive way of understanding this is from the vantage point of visual culture. For the last three decades, photographer Camila Vergara embarked on a monumental project photographing random buildings at various urban locales and sites in the most depressed sections of inner cities like Detroit, New York, Baltimore, the Bronx. And Vergara's objective was to create a visual archive documenting the cycle of urban social death, returning to the same photographic site month after month, year after year, 10, 20, 30 years, taking photo of the same building. You get a visual sense when you flip through the photos of the rapid transformation of that neighborhood. It's a powerful visual image that can be incorporated in living history. Documenting the evolution of black consciousness must involve an examination of the actions of individual African Americans who either through their force of personality or leadership ability mobilized others to recognize their own specific interests in new and radically different ways. This is micro history, the examination of individual cases, studies that help to illustrate broader patterns within a society. In theory, leadership stripped bare of ideology is the creative capacity of individuals of any group to realize that group's specific objective interests. The quote, comes from Ralph Miliband. Most black leaders, from abolitionist Fred Douglas to Jesse Jackson, have therefore interpreted black leadership primarily as a kind of capacity building from below. Capacity building from below. Building structures, inspiring structures of group advocacy of interest and resistance and renewal, which are genuinely and organically linked throughout the civil society within its various institutions. Intellectuals who assume leadership roles in the black community have, in a very general terms, endeavored to make vital contributions to that struggle to build capacities from below. In their, throughout their work and scholarly production. Any scholar, after all, who, like Dr. Du Bois, or even like myself when I was a boy, was ever forced to sit in the Jim Crow section at the back of a public bus, usually feels much more like a black person and much less like a PhD. History's power constantly shapes the realities of our lives and at least in the United States, sustains our parallel racial universes, frequently in quite subtle ways. By way of example, on the outskirts of Jerusalem, now Cortland, Virginia, in late August 1831, 
A band of slave rebels led by charismatic preacher Nat Turner began butchering white women, men, and children. Within about 48 hours, roughly 60 white folks, their slaveholders, their family members, had been brutally murdered. The horrified white authorities responded with overwhelming repression. They rounded up the rebels, along with at least 100, maybe 200 blacks, who had absolutely no roles, no personal involvement in the bloody insurrection. As many as 200 black people were burned alive, beheaded, or lynched. Turner himself was captured and hung on November the 11th, 1831. His corpse was subsequently decapitated. Strips of skin were said to have been removed and sewn into highly sought souvenir purses. The remnants of what was left of his corpse was thrown into an unmarked grave next to a railroad track. If you go to that side of history today, six of the 29 slaveholders' houses that Turner and his band visited still exist. They still stand. One current owner will proudly display for you, if you visit, the bullet hole left behind in the front of his house from the 1831 uprising. There are only two official signposts bearing witness to these great historical events. One is in the middle of a cotton field. Perhaps the most visible local representation of this famous unsuccessful slave rebellion is Blackhead Signpost Road which acquired its name from the fact that an African-American slave rebel's severed head once was mounted high on a stake at the entrance to this old country dirt road. The living history lesson here is that the continuing existence of Blackhead Signpost Road, now in 2004, is a vivid indication that for too many white Americans, they still believe that being white essentially means never having to say that you are sorry. For almost two centuries, whites have had great difficulty trying to explain to themselves the reasons for Nat Turner's infamous rebellion. Unleashing such violence against innocent whites. In the immediate aftermath of the uprising, the New York Morning Courier an inquirer newspaper in 1831 questioned readers why, quote, mistresses fame for their kindness, virgins renowned for their beauty, little helpless lisping infants in the cradle was shot, strewn down with axes, butchered with knives, by bashing their brains out by these fiends in human form, unquote. But from the oppositional terrain of black consciousness, a radically different set of questions emerges all predicated on the right of the oppressed people to use, as Malcolm said, by any means necessary to use force or violence to obtain freedom. For Du Bois, Nat Turner was, as the doctor put it, quote, the preacher revolutionist. Du Bois said Nat Turner was to lead, quote, the liberation, that he believed in liberation and that, quote, the first should be last and the last first, unquote. Ossie Davis. For Ossie Turner continues to represent, quote, our secret weapon, our ace in the hole, our private consciousness, unquote. For black, from a black revolutionary perspective, Turner's actions require little explanation, and they require no apology. Not far from the Turner uprising, is another silent marker to the hidden history of America's racial injustice. In the 1950s, blacks in Farmville, Virginia, mobilized en masse to demand de the desegregation of public schools. Local whites responded, of course, with the fervor of their ancestors as they responded in resisting Nat Turner. They simply and immediately, with the governors and the legislature, Sanction shut down the public schools in the county for a decade. They just shut it down. Whites set up private academies for their kids, and they condemned the so-called lost generation of blacks who lacked access to quality secondary schooling. 
to be penalized for life. When desegregation finally occurred in that part of Virginia in the fall of 1964, all of eight white kids showed up to attend school with 1,500 black children. It would take nearly 40 years, not until last year, 2003, for the Virginia legislature to pass a resolution admitting its, quote, profound regret, unquote, for the closing of Farmville's public schools. There was, of course, no compensation given to that lost generation or, the, its, or their descendants. The physical sites of Turner's uprising in the public school building in Farmville, Virginia, are important to me because memory is always linked closely with geography, physical space, and material culture. When African Americans attempt to reconstruct narratives told by their great-grandparents and grandparents, such efforts involve smells, sounds, tastes, cultural texture of processes and patterns of black daily life that frequently no longer exist. They're fragmented memories. Finding and claiming for oneself the geographical spaces or physical sites which culturally and historically significant individuals or groups or their practices once occupied provides a potential grounding from which a critical interpretation then becomes possible. This is particularly the case where the site marks a particularly horrific event, symbolically representing a larger political or social issue, a contradiction that still exists in the society. In the Bronx, for example, the former residents of West African immigrant Amadou Diallo killed by four plainclothes police officers of the NYPD Street Crimes Unit, shot at 41 times, struck 19 bullets, has become an informal site of community mourning and grief, but also political anger. Flowers are left in the bullet-scarred vestibule and outside the building on the anniversary of his death, February the 4th. 1999. For most Americans, the site of President Kennedy's assassination in Dallas, Texas, is unquestionably considered hallowed ground, whereas the Audubon Ballroom in Upper Manhattan, where Malcolm was brutally assassinated on February 21st, 1965, or the Bronx site of Diallo's killing, are not. Racism denies the possibility that African Americans possess the capacity to act in ways that create hollowed spaces for whites. This is part of the reason why blacks must define our own hallowed spaces using through our own criteria, drawing upon collective memories through new honorific rituals, civic, secular rituals at such sites. History then can be reborn and rearticulated for the totality of society. This is not an insular action or maneuver. This is a renegotiation with everybody. Columbia University Center for Contemporary Black History, which I started in 1992, has begun several living history projects based on the theoretical concept of historical political praxis, that is, the interrogation of the past with the advancement of political projects that actively challenge structural racism and the consequences and effects of discrimination. One of these projects involves a close partnership with Merle Evers Williams, former national chairperson of the NAACP, the widow of martyred civil rights leader Medgar Evers, that seeks to use reconstructed history as a vehicle for racial reconciliation and social justice in the state of Mississippi. If you want to do some good in the world, start at the worst place. The part of the project 
we had hoped, we had started developing in mid-2003, Freedom Summer 2004, projected a mobilization of 250 college-age students across the state for the purpose of organizing Freedom Schools and also registering thousands of new voters this summer. The project was to be timed to coincide with the 40th anniversary, of course, with Freedom Summer in 1964, when 1,000 northern, mostly white, students traveled to Mississippi to organize voters in poor black rural communities. That bloody summer across the state of Mississippi, 1,000 civil rights organizers were arrested, 80 were seriously beaten, 34 black churches, 30 black schools were firebombed, five civil rights organizers were murdered, most prominently, of course, Michael Schwerner, Andrew Goodman, and James Earl Cheney. That is the terrible history most white Mississippians still desperately want the entire world to forget. In August 1965, Congress passed the Voting Rights Act. The percentage of registered black voters soared from 6% in 64 to 61% in 1967. Jim Crow laws were overturned. But today, second-class citizenship has reemerged across the South, and especially through the adoption of repressive voter laws. In Mississippi, a citizen convicted of a felony loses the right to vote for life, for life. Consequently, 30% of all black male adults in the state today cannot vote, cannot vote. The, project, the projected goal of Freedom Summer 04, the field organizing campaign, was to focus greater civic awareness, to create a civic, con as Lonnie would put it, a conversation, a public conversation about mass disfranchisement and the social unfairness of it. And to get people who support these draconian measures to justify it. Even the right-wing Republicans have a hard time justifying the disfranchisement of people for life, for life. And we can win that argument. We can win that argument. Now, and we're winning that argument even in places like Texas and Alabama. It can be done, okay? Can be done. Now, we had already worked with several members of the Mississippi Legislative Black Caucus. We had planned to push for the adoption of more liberalized voting laws during the January 05 legislative session. We already had the bill. I wasn't happy with it because it called for the restoration of voting rights for nonviolent felons, former ex-felons. Half a loaf is better than none, you know, which is also my take on Kerry, but that's another discussion. <laughs> okay. part, of, part of the campaign was also a series of public educational or civic conversations in public venues where white and black Mississippians alike would be encouraged to talk candidly about the state's turbulent racial history, sharing personal experiences and stories. New media resources, archival research, oral history methodologies could all be part of an educational effort incorporating 40-year-old newsreel films, newspaper accounts, photographs, as well as recent oral interviews with the veterans of the original Freedom Summer. We had proposed the creation of, this was in our more ambitious iteration of the grant, the Families of the Disenfranchised. Families of the disenfranchised. You know where we got this from. Argentina. The families of the disappeared. Same thing. How we document how losing the right to vote profoundly and negatively affects everyone in the family. Everyone. How civic death, so civic death, or civil death, disenfranchisement destroys 
the potentialities of a community, which is exactly why the right wing is doing this. Massive disfranchisement, cutting us off from engagement in civic processes. That's the point of it. That's the point. Now, the grant proposal was developed. It was the best grant I ever wrote. And, you know, I've gotten fu stuff funded. I don't know why they gave me the money. But it was the best thing we had ever done. And we shopped it around without success. Some potential funders reviewing the project proposal dismissed it as being essentially a walk down civil rights memory lane. This is a symbolic gesture to the past that has little relationship or relevance with the state's current very serious socioeconomic problems. Now, one program officer, progressive, representing a foundation, I have to be careful because they may fund something else, <laughs> that has a history of supporting criminal justice-related projects, the Cognoscenti will know, suggested that I, quote, ask my friend, Russell Simmons, to bankroll this entire enterprise. Russell Simmons, Def Jab co-founder and hip-hop millionaire mogul. Quote, we all love Murley, this program officer explained defensively. But Manning, this is, quote, simply too political. <laughs> Apparently, the limits of liberal philanthropy stop at the boundaries of black liberation. The purposes of the center's Malcolm X project, initiated in 2001, are quite similar to the Freedom Summer Project. Whoa, I'm way over time. I'm moving this along, folks. We're almost done. It starts with the concept that a dialectical interpretation of events, whether they happened 100 years ago or yesterday, requires a 360-degree comprehensive approach. There is always a Rashomon story to be told in all major historical events such as Malcolm's assassination at the Audubon, oral history, new media, technology, have been used to critically explore all the divergent points of view about the actual events of the assassination. Ideally, the voices to be represented will include those of the Shabazz family members, political friends and associates of Malcolm X, the Nation of Islam, the convicted assassins, the New York City police, as well as those of the FBI, who certainly had its own operatives, informants, and others in the ballroom that terrible afternoon. If our educational project can help answer the lingering question of what those in law enforcement and government actually knew and did in this crime, a reconstructed history may help bridge the distance between our divided racial past and the present. The knowledge we produce could be incorporated into curricula of public schools, serving as an educational resource for a proposed memorial honoring Malcolm X at a completely renovated, reconstructed Audubon, which Columbia University now owns. Behind the idea of living history is the core belief, to restate it one more time, powerful narratives we construct about the past have the potential to reshape contemporary civic outcomes. One excellent example of this was C. Van Woodward's Strange Career of Jim Crow, published in 1955, a little book that was instrumental in destroying the myth that racial segregation had always existed across the South. Woodward's work convincingly laid the historical argument for King's understanding that biracial peace was possible in the South. Another element of living history I find especially attractive is this ethnographic dimension of participant observation. The living historian should feel obligated to become a civic actor as innovative knowledge collected and drawn from the past has the potential for shaping important legislative initiatives and enriching public school curricula. The goal is not just to educate and inform, but to transform the objective material and cultural conditions perpetuating the subordinate status of marginalized groups. The larger objective of the Malcolm X Project is not only to build a rich multimedia version of the autobiography, but to create a model for producing living black history. 
a critical intellectual project integrating the interdisciplinary methodologies and tools of new media, oral history, field research, and traditional archival research to construct a truly thick description of significant personalities, events, and social movements central to the construction of both black American and contemporary society. New media technology provides the tools for an unprecedented, rich interrogation of the past. Over the past two years, the project staff has interviewed a series of eyewitnesses to the assassination, and in the process has uncovered a number of new details about how the murder was actually committed. The forensic evidence and the possible suppression of information by the police and by the district attorney's office. Most of our students involved in the project have acquired, therefore, a very de a deep familiarity with the details of Malcolm's life and death that rival scholars who have published books on this. James Shabazz, Malcolm's secretary, the organized, head organizer of Muslim Mosque Incorporated, confessed to me after a four-hour grilling we gave him, it was the most thorough and intense emotional experience he had ever had since Malcolm's death. The Malcolm X Project, we're trying to reconstruct the past, providing a balanced and richer interpretation of this remarkable leader. But its broader purpose transcends romantic articulations of a black icon a rich, full interpretation of Malcolm. As a complicated and internally conflicted human being might contribute to more to empower young people than a frozen portrait of a dead revolutionary, it helps to create a full human appreciation of Malcolm as a personality when we learn that back in, in the summer of 1944, that Malcolm performed briefly as a drummer and dancer at Abe Gold Goldstein's Lobster Pond Bar and Grill in Midtown Manhattan. That when he was arrested on burglary and gun possession charges in Boston in January 1946, the detectives promised him that he would go, they would go lightly if he betrayed his accomplices, unlike in Spike's film, that he promptly and immediately did so. that the first extensive tour that he had of Africa and the Middle East was in the summer of 1959, not in 1964. Where was that in the film? Right? That Hale, Alex Haley and Malcolm collaborated together to construct for very, very different reasons and purposes a partially fictive Malcolm X. That's the one you know. And that's a shame. That's a shame. Because the actual personality is far more powerful and far more attractive than the literary, this very skillful literary representation that you know, what I call the Haley Malcolm text that is called the autobiography. You know that three chapters were left out of the book by Haley and not published? They're in a safe at a, by, owned by an attorney in Detroit. I'll talk about that tomorrow. Virtually all of Malcolm's opponents and his defenders, those who hate him and those who adore him, construct him as a static figure. When he was alive, the mainstream civil rights establishment and the media dismissed him as a zealot and an extremist. And after the publication of the autobiography, with Haley's liberal integrationist gloss and interpretation, they were convinced that Malcolm had been won over to their gradual pragma pragmatist philosophy. To his black nationalist defenders, Malcolm would be fixed for all time as a black shining prince, an icon incapable of making political errors or personal errors of judgment. He was tragically reborn as Saint Malcolm, placed on a lofty pedestal far above the black masses. Malcolm and Nello, as human beings, were quite different personalities. And what links them together is individuals that I care for deeply in my mind. It's not their race, but their passionate integrity, their passionate belief in the power of ideas and action. 
They were unafraid, simply unafraid to pursue the truth as they understood it, regardless of the personal consequences to them. And they committed a practice of doing this. This commitment of speaking truth to power follows the radical logic of another one of my heroes, Rosa Luxemburg, who once wrote, freedom is always and only freedom for the one who thinks differently. Prosaic myths, even well-meaning, even beautiful myths, tend to make oppressed people feel largely good about ourselves. But in the end of the day, it is only the truth that will set us free. This long view of black history explains why James, we're coming to the end, folks, may help explain why Nello, to my mind, with only the exception of the doctor, of Dr. Du Bois, is the greatest black intellectual of the 20th century. Rejected the concept of black studies. Nello rejected black studies. In 1969, before an audience of militant black powerites at D.C.'s federal, then Federal City College, Nello explained, quote, I do not recognize any distinctive nature of black studies. I do not know, as a Marxist, black studies as such. I only now, I only know the struggle of people against tyranny and oppression in certain social and political settings. It is impossible for me to separate black studies from white studies in any theoretical point of view, unquote. What James meant was that writing in race-based isolation removed from America's history, solely from, rather, America's, American history's racial mountain, that can provide a remarkably long yet incomplete view of the complex human condition. Black consciousness is a necessary, it is an absolutely essential precondition for agency, for capacity building from below, but it is not an end in itself. Blackness itself is a socially constructed category, was a product of domestic and transnational political economies and social forces. As those forces are transformed, the trajectory, content, and meaning of what blackness is, its content, its lived content of being black, also is transformed with it. Identities are multiple and situational. A more mature Riser Malcolm, only weeks before his murder, reflected the fundamental division of humankind was found in the deep structural inequalities separating the global haves and have-nots. This helps to explain why the late Malcolm X continued to criticize the call for civil rights, instead articulated call for human rights. In other words, a political historical praxis of liberation cannot be won solely within the foundations, it sounds like Nello, of the nation state. It must have a global and an internationalist vision. It must have an internationalist vision for it to be fully complete. To enrich the black intellectual tradition, we must dare to push the boundaries of what has become black studies beyond black studies. The historical construction of racialization in the United States was largely but not exclusively framed by the broad contours of the collective experiences of people of African descent. How can anyone doubt that Asian Americans also encountered structural processes of racialization in California in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. If not, what was the, the massive internment of 120,000 Japanese Americans all about? Today, 40% of the people who live in Harlem speak Spanish. Harlem's Dominican immigrants today still mostly dream, initially, of scaling the hierarchy of whiteness, but when they fail, they turn angrily against that dream deferred. Puerto Ricans consistently nationwide today have lower median household incomes than African-American households. History, of course, never repeats itself exactly because the next Malcolm X undoubtedly will speak Spanish as her native language. Racialization as a global historical process is secondary to the 
dynamic of inequality and world accumulation, which transcends all traditional boundaries, including those of color. As black schol study scholars examine the socioeconomic wastelands of some of America's gutted, gutted inner cities, we may begin to understand the strategic. One might describe these pro episodes as a kind of hidden history, divorced from the public record, unscrutinized, relegated to the deep margins. It is these secret holocausts that living history as political praxis must illuminate and make fully public. Living history must incorporate a dialectical method, an appreciation of what history has in store for us in America's and the world's wastelands, its ghettos, its barrios, central cities. As the numbers in our prisons swell, as the millions of new politically disfranchised grow, new social protest movements, spontaneous insurrections will emerge. Many of these new leaders will speak very different languages. Many of these new leaders will have different demands and grievances. They will have different cultural traditions and have very different agendas for action. But I believe that if they know the history of resistance, that they will also quote and honor Malcolm X as one of their own. Thank you. Right. Now, I'm at Harvard, so you don't want me to be intimidated. So I will say, please make your question in the form of a question. <laughs> Have at least a, yes, like a, a pretense of a question. Okay, yes. Funding. Right. <clears throat> Public schools, as most of you know, the fundamental contradiction is that they are undercapitalized in terms of per capita funding for students. Now, I know that the right wing likes to cite figures that show, say, in New York City, a kind of fictive $11,000 per student, let's say, per child in New York City versus the suburbs, which may only be $8,500 per child. But that's not real. Because if you look, for example, at the 50 largest public school systems in the United States, there are about 50 that have at least 250 that represent 250,000 population in the city. Those 50 school systems handle nearly half of all kids with special needs in the total country. They handle about 40% of the children who speak uh, a language other than English. They have to feed a third of the kids breakfast in the morning, otherwise they don't eat during the day, uh, all day, so that they must spend money on non-instructional support, far more so than the suburbs. So when you take that capitalization, that capital out, instructional dollars, the, the disparity between the suburbs and er, inner city is huge. So having a critical conversation about how do we refinance public schools will be extremely difficult in the United States for reasons you know better than I do, because this is your field. It has to be, I, I would have an omnibus approach. This will sound a little prosaic, 
but a kind of social, Stoian social contract discussion about what should be the relationship between people and the state that speaks to a quality of life that all of us should have as citizens or permanent residents of the United States, legal residents of the United States, or legal aliens of the United States. Right? What do people have a right to expect? I tried to actually get to that in a book I wrote called The Great Wells of Democracy, The Meaning of Race in American Life. And the chapter on, pu on public education tried to get at that. But because so many of our schools, so I don't have a satisfactory answer. Fighting this thing at the state level and trying to transform how public schools are financed, I think that's a non-starter. I don't think we can win that fight. I think we have to actually approach it. We need to do a progressive version of perish the thought. When Bush came in with a right-wing view of a national agenda for schools. And now, okay, it was driven by all kinds of backward and bankrupt ideas. You know, high states, stakes testing, et cetera. But a progressive uh, approach to a national education policy is really, is only gonna answer that question that can address the allocation of national resources to those sites of the greatest financial disparity to enhance the actual amount of money that goes toward instruction for kids in central cities and in impoverished areas. That's going to take federal policy. Can't be one in New York, I don't think. <laughs> Will we attempt to have Freedom Summer 2005? Uh, on Friday afternoon, on um, Thursday afternoon after the last lecture, I literally have to get on a plane and go to Jackson, Mississippi to be there on Friday morning. Julian Bond and I and a couple other people are meeting with Murley over the weekend to figure out what we're going to do. So we are going to do something this summer. I'm not sure exactly what, funded or not, <laughs> right? But in 05, see, there is no substitute for actually putting, like SNCC workers used to say, you must put your body on the line. Um, I'll embarrass him, but he's a remarkable young man. Uh, Tim McCarthy is sitting over here someplace. He was over here, I think. Anyway, where's Tim? He was, he was here. He's not here. He had, he had, yes, okay. Tim, well, now I can talk about him because he's gone. Ah, <laughs> uh, he's one of my students at, at Columbia. He's, he's been here for a while as an instructor. Uh, and when Tim first came to Columbia, back in the, you might remember in the mid-90s, this whole wave of hundreds of church burnings across the south. He went down south in the spring and helped to build rebuild black churches. There's nothing like putting your body on the line. It makes knowledge real. It makes it real. And what is missing are practices of liberation. Now some people will say this is simply symbolic representation or symbolic intervention. That's not true. Because it, it is transformative to the person, to the individual. And you carry that, those practices with you. And they help shape and inform how you think critically about the ideas we carry in our heads. I never really understood this until I moved to New York. Take a look at my writing since I've lived there. Look at my stuff before. And now look at it. The differences in the city and how it shapes. Or the writing about uh, in Great Wells of Democracy, going into Sing Sing. I could not understand Malcolm. I couldn't understand the human 
story that he bore, that he bears, until I actually physically went into cell block B. Couldn't understand it. I understand it now. It is a tr powerful and transformative experience to imagine young women or men intellectually engaged in a realm of ideas who suffer in a level of Dante's hell. And that the power of that has, it greatly shapes how you write. It just does. And so that opportunity is really important. I also, this is a generation of white Mississippians like Trent Lott, who desperately want to obliterate our shared experience. Don't let them get away with it. <laughs> All right? We have to document what we know to be true. And in doing so, it allows us to heal and redeem this nation. I really believe intensely that we can win this fight. We can win it because what we seek is not wanting to take away something from white folk. We just want everybody at the table. And then we can haggle over how we redistribute, shall I put it, since, I can, since we, were, we were friends, the means of production. Okay. But what's on the agenda right now is a civics lesson. It's a civics lesson. This is an engagement of what is the nature of democracy and what should it be. This is chapter two of Nello. That's what I envision. We can win this fight. And I want you to think about how you can participate. Not necessarily in the Freedom Summer 05, although it may indeed be that way. Imagine doing a Freedom Summer in the summer and fall of 06 in key battleground states instead of in Mississippi in Pennsylvania, Florida, in uh, New Jersey, Ohio, which just coincidentally, Florida, are also the states in those districts where Democrats or progressives can win and tip the balance of power in the House or Senate. There's a lucky convergence of historical reconstructed memory and utility in transforming power relations, okay? Now this is not just a walk down memory lane because it also enhances capacity building of black civil society and, stru and institutional structures at the grassroots level. We actually sit down and talk with black legislators. Imagine what we can do at the historical site of the assassination of Malcolm X programmatically what we can do. What we can do in discussing with teachers, the forensic evidence of the assassination, what it tells us when we look, I know it is grisly, but we do this. Look at the autopsy photo. Look at the physical evidence, which tells us actually the angle and the distance of how he was shot. And then we can reconstruct a crime. And there is no statute of limitations on murder. Okay. So I love this project because it actually contests and it can challenge and fight through the use of knowledge for power. And that is what intellectuals must do. Somehow, black studies has forgotten this. They have forgotten this. That's what you boys did. You used knowledge in the struggle for power to transform our material conditions. That's it. I'm not trying to give you a blueprint on what you ought to do. I'm just suggesting that there is a link between knowledge production and the struggle for power and fighting to enhance capacities of disfranchised and disadvantaged groups. It is a simple concept. And that should be 
the moral obligation of the intellectual. That is what we should do. And we can get away with it. Or at least most of us can. Yes. Yes. Very eloquent question. Question pertains to, for those who didn't hear it, the connection between Malcolm and Martin and what we can learn from their practices that might help enhance our understanding of both, that sheds light and might empower us today. Martin and Malcolm are presented still as anti podal figures. This is a mistake. And it's a mistake at many levels. Because at the end of their lives, as we know, and scholars such as James Cone and others have pointed out over the last decade that there is clearly a convergence of views between the two men at the end of their lives. The first person, one of the most prominent Americans to oppose the Vietnam War publicly, before the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution in August 1964 was Malcolm X. He called out the Johnson administration and opposed the war. He linked the Vietnam War to the struggles of colonized people transnationally. Malcolm said the struggle is not for civil rights, it is for human rights. It went going to the United Nations and charging the United States with crimes against humanity, right? Cry against in the United States in a court of international opinion. It was Malcolm who raised the question of the need for the civil rights movement to link its analysis to a structural critique of economic inequality transnationally. Malcolm put it in more simplified language. Capitalism is a chicken and freedom is a duck egg. No way a chicken can lay a duck egg unless it's a revolutionary chicken. <laughs> Brother Malcolm is right. <laughs> you know, it, the critique of capitalist, glo globalized capitalism is in Malcolm. He was very clear about that at the end of his life. And you look at Martin and what is he saying? Malcolm's, Martin's saying, let's do a poor people's march. He's killed organizing sanitation workers in Memphis. He uh, says that, you know, we need to internationalize the struggle. Uh, we need to focus on Vietnam. He gives the speech at Riverside Church on April the 4th, 1967. He's cut, he's cut down brutally in Memphis exactly a year later after he delivers that speech. There are many parallels in evolution of the two men. It is true that one was a Muslim and the other was deeply Christian and one was believed in by any means necessary and the other was deeply anchored to Gandhian notions of satyagraha and soul force and nonviolence and, morals and moral transformation. But Malcolm was also about moral transformation and was a deep believer in faith in Allah. And there is no question that he was a minister. And to me, the deepest misinterpretation of Malcolm is, is to secularize his worldview 
and take him outside of the context of the history of Islam in the, in the world. I mean, if you want to find a connection to the black Muslims, it's not good. Everybody in the literature who writes about the Muslim NOI says it's like an outlier. It's not a part of the Islamic kind of construct. Please, look at Sufism. Look at Sufism and link that up with NOI. And you'll find a lot of parallels, OK? So let's get clear. They're a part of the mix. And to see Malcolm as a product of race, class, struggle in an Islamic construct, that's the way you have to approach this guy. And almost no scholar other than Richard Turner, nobody else does it that way. OK? So let's remake this. But on these two men, they are both products of a historical moment. I had to leave out a whole section of the talk, otherwise you'd be here until 8 o'clock, that talked about how history creates spaces for the articulation of social actors at various moments. If you look at the window of 1925, who was born in 1925? Well, there's Malcolm, there's Franz Fanon, there's Amilcar Cabral of Guinea-Bissau, and there's Megger Evers. Megger and Malcolm were born seven weeks apart, both brutally assassinated, both leaders. See kind of where I'm going with this living history stuff? History creates spaces. This is a generation that came to maturity right after World War II, but prior to 1960, fighting against structural racism, colonialism, Jim Crow segregation, globally. And they all invested and generated black radical projects of various types. And if you think about it as cohorts of generations, they were struggling against the structure of white preference and privilege and power and black inequality across the planet. And these two brothers, Malcolm and Martin, they used different, they had different philosophical approaches, but what they were about is the liberation of black minds and bodies. That's a little general, but that's true. And also the realization a full freedom for humankind. That was Martin and Malcolm's project. They went about it very differently. They went about it very differently. But to make them opposites and to set one way over here and over there does violence to both. And we can learn from their courage. And the best way we learn from people is not to put them like up here. That's what so many of the nationalists do to Malcolm. Make him, bring him to the people. Show that he is fully human. You can't be that. You can only be a human being. With all the mistakes and the frailties, the weaknesses that Malcolm had. And that if he was here, he'd be quite honest about it. Martin would be very honest about it. And we invest so heavily and turn these people into statues, to static figures. It does, it's a distortion because it t separates young people from their ability to see themselves in those historic roles. You divest them of agency. I always say Fannie Lou Hamer was great and Medgar Evers was great and Merle Evers because they are thus human beings with all of our strengths, all of our fears, but they overcame them and that we too can overcome ours by what we do. And that's the most empowering lesson you can give young people. Then it becomes truly revolutionary that people see themselves as the agents in the making of their own history. And that is what we must teach. If we success, if we do nothing else but that, you know, we've done our job. 
And that is, the, that is what my indictment of black studies is. We have forgotten what our job is. One more, I guess, question over here. Nope, yes, no. Way in the back, yes. Yes. I, I get your question. Okay. You know, this should not be your, this is not, this is not your promo. It is, it is disruptive and disrespectful. I mean, you know, you don't have like bad manners. <laughs> no, 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 that's, that's enough of this. That's enough of this. I'll, I'll respond to the question that you've asked and I will respect that question. Respect what I am saying to you. Now, what I think, what I would argue is that you should reread your history because you obviously do not know it. Malcolm said that any black man who votes for a Democrat or a Republican is a traitor to the race to which he belongs. But he also said that if I had 10 black men like Adam Clayton Powell Jr. in Congress today, I could retire. Malcolm reflected contradictory attitudes simultaneously on the issue you speak to. Your point is correct, it is incomplete, as is your political knowledge. Let us speak truth to power about this. The contestation, the Spartacist League does not represent the masses of people in terms of political engagement on the question of the Democratic Party. And in reality, Malcolm struggled with this question. He oscillated between the apolitical conservatism that was a tradition of the NOI with his recognition that to interface with African Americans who could contest for independent political power through the creation of the Freedom Now Party in Detroit and in other parts of the country as a vehicle to challenge the two-party system and working with, in a very open way, progressive blacks in the Democratic Party, as he did, especially Powell, a multiple of inside-outside interventions would be necessary as the framework for intervention. He never quite consistently framed a unified political view. He didn't have a chance. He got killed. That's not his problem. That's just where, that's just the story. So indeed, he said what you just said, yes. But he also said this. My job is not to falsify history or to complicate your life. It is complicated, but that's life. So I'm telling you, kind of like it is. That's the story. Okay, now if anybody else doesn't want to do an intervention. All right. Thank you.